right, we'll get started. Thank you everybody so much for coming. Welcome to the Universal Asians online event, How to Avoid the Trap of Boba Liberalism as Asian Adoptees with your host, Haley Hudler. The Universal Asian is an open and safe online platform aiming to provide inspiration to Asian adoptees, imported Asians, and immigrated Asians, hyphenated Asians, around the world. We strive to mainstream discussion on any and every topic that helps make our community of Asian voices universally heard. It is our aim to bring people together, so please feel free to reach out to us if you would like to be interviewed or want to share something of your own or collaborate on a future event. I want to let everyone know that we are going to be recording this, so if you are not comfortable with that, I will put my email in the chat for you to contact me and let me know, and we will make sure your name and face are removed for your own privacy. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat and let Haley take the whole time to talk and focus on that. Um, if she has time to check out the chat and read some comments, uh, that's awesome. But mostly I will be watching that for her. So take it away. So first we will begin, what is mobile liberalism? So this was a term coined by the Twitter user at D Diaspora is Red, who says this is a type of mainstream liberal Asian American politics that like the drink is sweet not very offensive, but also not that good for you. It's just empty calories. So that was um, the Twitter user's original definition of bobo liberalism. So this is a little graphic of um, like an Asian, quote unquote Asian woman sitting on top of a boba drink. So boba itself for those, I think maybe everyone here who has tried boba before, but it's a, it's a drink that comes from Taiwan, I believe. And it's, it's just like a tea, it's like milk tea or any kind of flavored tea of any flavor and you put tap like black tapioca balls in it and it's kind of just that's the drink and so the liberalism part is when it comes into understanding what liberalism is and like different ideologies which i don't have too long to explain what that is but <laughs> i'll also just read some of the definitions i was able to grasp online about this new term because it is so new Bobo liberalism is a critique of mainstream Asian American political identity that at its surface, um, that it's a surface level activism and focuses on assimilation and class privilege while ignoring fundamental questions of social and economic justice. For example, wanting to reconnect with your roots by drinking bubble tea, which is also boba tea, getting added to subtle Asian traits and organizing fundraisers for your Asian student group but never studying your history and feeling solidarity with your homeland against imperial imperialism. So I'm taking a lot of things that um, were described through some articles I found on mobile liberalism. So how did I first get introduced to this topic? I would like to say um, it's still pretty new to me and I felt as I've been learning about it in the past couple of months that it was definitely worth educating people on it as well. That's how important I felt it was. So when the rise of the Stop Asian Hate movement began, I tried to figure out what my role in this, in, in that movement is and how can I make a difference in my community by speaking out. I was at first happily surprised Asian celebrities were speaking out about hate crimes that were happening in the API community, but then questioned why is this happening now in March of 2021 when the pandemic started a whole year earlier in March, 2020. So um, then I stumbled upon Dr. Kiona's Instagram, AKA how to not travel like a basic bitch. She made a post that warned several different Asian groups to think before speaking out about oppression faced by the API community. Um, the different groups that she called out are usually groups who normally stay silent about oppression faced by Asians. And um, she was speaking to how they are not truly informed about the issues Asians and Pacific Islanders go through. There was a lot of backlash in the adoptee community as Dr. Kiona specifically addressed Asian adoptees in saying that we need to pass the mic to other Asians. And I initially was offended by her post thinking that she was saying adopted Asians do not get harmed by Asian hate crimes. But as I thought about her post more, she addressed also middle to high class Asians as well as mixed race, mixed race Asians as well. 
And so I was digging through more of her work because she has several degrees on her. She's a doctor and, and I know that. And so I was digging through some of her previous work that she's done and I stumbled upon her, uh, a couple of her work that she's done with the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center where she explains bubble liberalism. So I'll show you that clip right now in her video that kind of explains that. There are also Asian Americans that deny their own oppression exists. In the next slide, we see this sentiment is so common and detrimental to the liberation of Asian Americans that Asian Americans have come up with the term, quote, oba liberal to identify those within the community who uphold the modern minority myth. This term is used to describe Asians that superficially embrace their Asian identity, such as when drinking boba tea, while not having to show any concerns about politics around Asian identity. Common characteristics are an Asian who gaslights someone who talks about the racism that the Asian community faces, an Asian who denies the struggle that the Asian community faces, an Asian who advocates for communities outside of their own but stay silent when their own community is in danger, or an Asian who only acknowledges their culture when it is trendy or in style. We can see this play out today during COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement. As the rate of violent Asian hate crimes were rising across the globe from February to May, it was noticed how many Asian celebrities did not speak out against what was happening to their communities for fear of being too political in their identities. However, those same Asian celebrities came together for the Black Lives Matter movement in May and advocated for the just treatment of Black people. And while it's not only great, but necessary to advocate for other communities, the blatant denial of one's own community in the danger just months before leaves the most marginalized Asians without support from those of platforms to raise awareness. This results in the Asian victims of murder and violence silenced, erased, and invisible to the non-Asian population. While this terminology may change over time, the baseline characteristics won't. The Asian that denies their oppression usually has class privilege and is then used by non-Asians as a wedge to continue to deny Asian oppression. This behavior and the amplification of boba liberals as spokespeople for the Asian community in the media is incredibly dangerous to Asian liberation and representation. But who even is Asian American and who Great. So we'll get to more of uh, that lecture as well. But I just wanted to show you all that clip, especially because when I first watched this lecture and and in its entirety, it's it's a it's a full hour long. But um, I began to realize that I was a boba liberal when and when I watched that originally, and I felt a lot of grief knowing that. Um, I began to learn from that. I'm I'm trying to learn and change my understanding of what it means to be Asian. And when I was growing up, I, I used to think that Asians faced less discrimination compared to darker people of color, such as Muslims, Latinx community, and the Black community. But I was wrong. <laughs> Asians do face the same kinds of oppression, but I wouldn't know that because of several privileges that come with being adopted into a white family. So I want to continue with the lecture by Dr. Kiona so we can have a greater understanding of API oppression in the USA and um, the Asian diaspora. So. Just a bit, I'm going to show you another good clip within this uh, video as well. Foreigners. Okay, let me, oh, there are horns around, start at 16 around. About. All right, so here comes me. <laughs> so going back to who gets counted as being Asian, let's discuss how Asian people are not a monolith and experience real effects of these stereotypes. Asian people cover a huge landmass and many different cultures, shades of skin, languages, and religions, amongst other things. Because of the vast difference across the continent, each country has a different individual relationship with the United States and its immigration patterns. For example, many Vietnamese, Hmong, and Laotian people arrived to the United States after the US war in Vietnam as war refugees. These refugees were resettled within the United States in impoverished conditions and having experienced real wartime trauma. Many Indians, on the other hand, uh, migrated to the United States on H-1B visas, which self-selects already educated and wealthy Asians due to the strict requirements of the visa. Now, when we look at the statistics, throwing all Asians together in an aggregated model, despite having such different migration patterns, it does not take into account historical context and barriers to access, therefore is incredibly harmful. So as you can see on the left-hand side, the Asian American um, becomes Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, all of the different uh, race uh, ethnicities that make up the Asian American once the once it's disaggregated. 
It is the difference between Asians migrating and education and class privilege that was already attained in Asia, and those have come to the United States as refugees, wartime survivors, or were human trafficked to the USA to replace black and slave labor. To make matters more complicated, Asians have a history of facing legal racism within the United States. Asians are the only race who have had multiple race-based laws specifically prohibiting their migration to the United States, starting with the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the 1800s. Therefore, there are crucial differences between generations of Asians. For example, those who came before the Chinese Exclusion Act are generationally American and speak English as a first language. And then there are those who are newly arriving and navigating system and language barriers. There are also those who are brought to the USA as servants and those who are coming to the USA to further their education, all of which affect how an Asian American is faring in the United States. The historical context among Asian data is incredibly important to take into account as our differences start long before we actually arrive in the USA. So treating us statistically as a monolith means drowning out important patterns in data and as pointed out here, the differences between our migration patterns as well as the generations that we're in the United States. If we go to the next slide, um, Asians are already a minority within a minority. As you can see how sparse Asians are spread out in the United States, mostly congregating in metropolitan areas on coasts. This means that national data does not accurately reflect Asian patterns. Location-specific data where Asians are widely represented make it possible to really see the issues the Asian, com Asian community is facing. For example, in 2012, the NYC mayor's office reported that Asian Americans, I believe it's on the next slide, had a poverty rate of 29%, the highest of any racial or ethnic group, as you can see on the graph. But then Asian community organizations only received 2.8% of the total value of the city's social service contracts. However, if we were to look at national data, it would tell us a different story. Next slide, please. Here on the left-hand side, you'll see this commonly touted statistic used to uphold model minority myths. It shows that the Asian American median household is considerably more than even the white American. Wow, maybe Asians are crazy rich. Well, as much as I'd love to claim that, there are multiple factors missing in the story. The story is in reality not showing you that Asians make more money than any other group. This is showing you that Asians have more members per household as they are most likely to have three or more working individuals per household than any other group skewing the data. Also, if you remember the map from before, you saw that Asians populate in metropolitan cities such as San Francisco and New York City where the cost of living is incredibly high. So what you're also seeing here is how much Asians have to spend in order to survive. In addition, after accounting for the time it takes to go to school and the numbers of hours worked compared to their counterparts to achieve the salary that they do, Asians failed miserably in reaching that of white Americans, needing many, many more years of education just to make the same amount as whites. To break it down even further, when this data is disaggregated, which by the way is imperative to Asian American data, to the point where I won't even look at data if it's not disaggregated, you'll see the quote, all Asians are rich myth, used on East Asians in particular, completely obliterated. While East Asians are commonly seen as rich or the model minority and accused of having the privilege of being, quote, almost white, you'll see here that it is actually the dark-skinned Asian, the Indian American that has the highest household income at the very, very top. East Asians, uh, pointing with the arrows on the right-hand side, failed to even meet the average of the Asian American household income and Koreans who migrated after the Korean War and did not get refugee status barely even meet the U.S. median household income. And even more important to note are the Southeast Asians, as indicated by the yellow arrow on the left-hand side, are living well below poverty line and of whom many are on government assistance. So the argument that Asians are almost white, referencing East Asians and their light skin privilege, and the myth that it turns into financial gain is just not supported by any data here. And there's no evidence that skin color and income have any correlation. This shows the Asian identity as one of the most heterogeneous groups and points out the fallacy in how we conceptualize the Asian and what picture and perceptions do we perceive the Asian person to be. I also wanna point out that specifically Hmong Americans and indigenous groups have the lowest per capita income of any racial or ethnic group nationwide. But you would never be able to know that without the disaggregation of data and that our indigenous groups are some of the most vulnerable groups in the United States. Now
thank you all for watching all of that. I know it was like many, many <laughs> minutes of watching her uh, her lecture, but I would say I gained so much from watching that lecture. So I really wanted to show all of you that. So the last little thing I want to talk about, and then we'll go into some discussion questions, is how exactly do adoptees fit into this, and how do we kind of fall into the trap of global liberalism? So. Asian adoptees who are adopted into the West are usually not adopted within their own culture. And as we try to connect with our heritage and Asian culture, we look to cultural foods, to music, to media, to feel connected. Unfortunately, through those methods, we will still not truly understand the struggles of low-class Asians and first-generation Asians who struggle with immigration citizenship issues, language barriers, and lack of means of financial stability and access to education and healthcare. Adopted Asians will never see those struggles personally if we are not actively educating ourselves on these issues, on issues that we don't face personally in our lives. We can only understand that truth of racial oppression towards Asians if we understand who we are in the context of our immigration and also our connection to our motherlands. So I just wanted to show you my work cited because it's very important. <laughs> so thank you all. That is that is the um, my little uh, presentation. But so now I would like to um, go into some discussion questions. I think you all can see me now. I'm back on camera. Um, so now is the time for if you feel up to it and if you would like, I would like um, you all to participate in um, some of these questions. So the first is how are you feeling? And what are your initial reactions? And also, are some of these things in this presentation very new for you? Like, are, are these new things that you've heard just now? I can uh, say that, um, well, I came in a little late. Honestly, I That's accidentally okay. thought that it started at 9 Central instead of 9 Eastern. So I was like 10 minutes in, so I missed like half the presentation. Aww. But yeah, I would say this is a pretty new concept to me and hearing it. Um, and just like knowing the access that I as an adoptee have is so limited, it kind of feels like hard to escape the, the uh, initial draw of boba liberalism. And so it, um, it just makes me wonder like if it's possible really to escape that and like how authentically I would be able to do such a thing. So I'm feeling like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you so so much, Sophie, for being honest with that. And I, I also feel like it's, if we can't ever experience what it's like to be like a first gen immigrant or a, an Asian living here who can't speak English. And I, I, I feel like it's, there's only so much we can do to put ourselves in a position that we're not in, but also know that as Asians living in the West, as Asians living in the USA, we do have a job to not represent all Asians. That's a lot of <laughs> that's a lot on us. But I do think we need to know what the we need to know what's going on to our racial group, even if it's not directly impacting us. Yeah. Anyone else have initial reactions or feelings or thoughts about what I was able to present to you in some of the videos or some of the things I reflected on? Okay, hi Haley, hi everybody. Um, my name is Chris, pronouns she, him, his. Uh, if you hear background noise, I am trying to put my daughter to sleep as well. Um, I, I love this uh, lecture, Haley, it was great. It's something that has always been in the back of my mind. I just never had a term or a phrase for it. Like I've always known as a, you know, as an Indian adoptee, who, of course you know my story, um, even how it has been, I've never been 100% informed on all things pertaining to, uh, you know, not just Asians here in the U.S., but even just South Asians, just all any of that. But again, it's how we we're raised and how we're brought up culturally. We're not put in those situations or to know and learn. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's important now to just, if nothing else, be informed of all the things that are happening for the people of our uh, ethnicities and you know it's you know when I think Asia I think of it in a broad term not just East Asian Southeast Asian or South Asia I, I usually from my perspective I see it as a big window because it is it's it does include all of us in that continent um but yeah those are my quick thoughts about it uh 
and you know even though the term in this case is boba liberalism <laughs> which i know boba is more you know <laughs> east asian i'm totally yes. fine with that too i would use the same term or even you know i don't find a need to like masalify it or anything of that nature. <laughs> i think <a> samosa liberal <laughs> samosa yeah, liberal. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's you know no, that's just yeah. my perspective you know i when i think asia i think of it as a whole not just individual countries so mm-hmm. no thank you so much chris uh i thought it was like interesting um my name's kate hi i like heard of the term like one of my um adoptee friends like used it and i was like what are you saying like and she explained it to me and like i think it's still like getting used to learning the term obviously because it's like I personally don't use it like on a regular you know basis so it's interesting I think like to add what like Chris said like he's totally like spot on about like you know like how like we're not like I mean most of us were raised in a a white family so I mean um we're just a different race of a family so it's a little bit harder obviously and connecting to you know our roots and everything I think that's harder like and I'm still learning I think we're all still learning in the sense of like most of the history like I I'm bad at history anyway so it's like learning that obviously is another part but also like still feeling like out of place if that makes sense so I think just like coming to like I've sort of come to terms with it in the sense of like we're never gonna feel I guess like in a box, if that makes sense, or being like, you know, uh, a sense of like identity, like we have that like identity. So it's sort of like, I don't think we're ever gonna have that, which I think we can like try as much as we can, but like, does that make sense? Okay. I'm just- I think, I think I know what you're saying. Like, yeah, like thinking about how, oh, like we can't ever experience or come to know the experiences of other Asians or other like low class Asians and knowing that maybe sometimes that'll make adoptees feel like we're quote unquote less Asian or not. We don't, if we don't get the true version of oppression, then like, are we really Asian? And I, I think I would say we're to make you feel better or to make, this is how I make myself feel better, I guess, is that when it comes to culturally, like a lot of us being adopted, like, in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, like around that range, in, and being in the USA, we are very close to the same realities as Asians who are not adopted, who are now second, third generation, who are now like the grandchildren of immigrants. And so the reason why I say that is that us personally in our own small town cities across the, the USA and other Western countries, we're trying to assimilate, we're trying to feel like we belong, we're trying to get along with uh, the white community that we were raised in. And so are others. So are these other second and third gen uh, Asians who are also trying to figure out, well, hey, like my family's from Singapore and or they're from Malaysia or they're from like J- Japan, but I haven't been there personally. And they feel like they have a loss of language and they feel a bit disconnected from their motherland. So I would say like we we are not necessarily alone in feeling like we're not Asian enough. Cause I see so many like third, fourth gen Asians who are now living in the USA who can't speak their, who can't speak their Asian language. They feel also that odd, odd middle ground of where do I fit? So I, I re I say that all just to remind age, like adopted Asians that we're kind of culturally sim- very similar to them in that struggle. And I all, the very last thing I'm thinking about is that, even if we don't experience the language barrier or we're not struggling with financial difficulties or we're not a low low income Asian, it doesn't mean we need to force ourselves to become that. It's like, we can't force ourselves to live that reality because it's just not our reality, but we can be aware of it. We can speak out on it and we can uplift those voices because clearly I think those Asians are struggling. Like they're going through a lot, lot more than I, than I am. And I know that because this is the last thing I'll say, and I'll have more people, you know, express their own thoughts and opinions on this. Cause I'm sure as I'm saying things, it's popping up ideas from people, but I think I was reflecting on why are celebrities speaking out now during like the stop Asian hate, because we know that the pandemic started a whole year before, but even I was pretty reluctant to say anything 
like, oh, I saw like a couple of news articles like, oh, wow, a woman got slashed in the face on the sidewalk or, or someone got beat down or so and so, like all of these things that were going on online about, you know, East, specifically East Asian people being harmed because of COVID, you know, the, the, the you know, the made belief, the make belief idea that, oh, if you are of if you are from China, particularly, you definitely carry COVID, which I think a lot of adoptees and a lot of Asians were pretty, <laughs> it, it, we, I feel like I would have never, I thought it was impossible, I guess, for me to actually come across like being scared on the street, like actually fearing for my lives. And it reminded me how, how, um, what's the word? how limited my privileges or how limited my protection is like the protection of the Asian body is only so there's a limit to that. And once it, once COVID happened, we definitely know, oh, wow, like <laughs> we really aren't protected. We really aren't safe in where we live. And that was a big shock to the system for everyone. And I also know for those first couple of months of the pandemic, I probably wasn't go out, going going to go out of my way and just start rallying and start saying things about it because I think that came into like that adoptee privilege of well once the pandemic is over I don't have to deal with this once people once this starts to fade away in a year and uh, over a year or a couple of months I won't really have to face this kind of discrimination to this extreme level as much as now that I'm realizing other Asians who always are struggling with oppression that I don't face on the daily so thank you all for responding to that question and I think I'm going to pose another question for the group if that's okay if there if there's anything else I wasn't sure if anyone else had more any one had addition and sorry I'm like getting a bit flustered but if anyone had any more things to say about their initial reactions um cool so the second question I wanted to ask everyone is knowing about global liberalism and knowing how it's kind of detrimental to the understanding of getting to that progress of Asians being liberated from how we're, how we're racialized. Um, how does this complicate your own relationship and what it means to be Asian? How does knowing about vulgar liberalism make you feel different about being Asian in the West and in the USA? So I think for me, the hardest part is I don't know what it means to be Asian. Like, I don't know how to be Asian. You know, that's the biggest challenge. It's like, yes, I want to involve myself and somehow get out there and do more, but I don't know how to fit in those situations. Like, even if I went to, um, you know, here in Columbus, Ohio, I live in Columbus, Ohio, we do have a lot of, we have a large Indian presence here. And if I were to go out there and put myself in situations, I know I'd feel uncomfortable. People around me would look at me and, you know, they just have too many questions and, you know, it would make me nervous and, uh, again, just feel like I don't fit in and I don't know what I could do to help in those situations. And I think that's, you know, the biggest challenge is just trying to learn what it means to be more um, Indian as the Indian that I am in order to uh, advocate and do things like that. Um, I think, too, it's it it's challenging as adoptees. Um, to like chris said to know how to put yourself in those situations but it's even harder when the your initial attempts are going to be online um you know to see what how do people respond if i talk about this if i say this um and try to bring those things up and then as you said Haley, um people were getting pushback from the Asian community that they were trying to speak up for. And I think that's so detrimental to progress because it makes people even more nervous than they already would have been about trying to fit in those spaces. Um, and I think what makes your situation so unique is that um, instead of being discouraged, you kind of stepped up to the plate um and took initiative to 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 kind of go into this area you didn't know a lot about so that you could improve yourself and see how to become you know 
a better ally as well as, you know, put yourself into these conversations and spaces, which is amazing. So, yeah, <laughs> I guess I didn't really have a question, but just a... <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the compliment, Hannah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think about like now that I, now that there's a, an official terminology for Bobo thinking, Bobo liberal thinking, and I think it's, it stems from that generational thing that Dr. Kiona was saying in her lecture that the reason why this phenomenon or this kind of thinking is occurring is because you have Asians who, who are middle high class, they have everything they need financially with education, they're pretty well off, and they also want to become accepted. They want to be accepted in, in the now, the now USA that they live in now. And in order to feel like they are accepted, oh, if people start liking K-pop, I think that means they like me more. Oh, like all of my, all of my other people of color friends and my white friends, they're going out and eating dim sum and they're eating hot pot and they like love it. So like, I understand like it's a, it is, it's a nice thing to feel like people are appreciating your culture, but the, those surface level things, as well as like media representation of the, oh, Crazy Rich Asians and just the new, the, the Marvel movie that came out with a, a Shang-Chi, like the, if people, if Asians are like, oh, wow, maybe I am feeling like people are beginning to like me or my culture, I still don't think it's, I think it's important, but it's, it, to say that, to say that the only thing that Asians are fighting for is representation, like that's, that's just not the case. Like there's so much more that's going on that are behind the scenes that are, you know, like a lot of you, a, a lot of you who um, may have, may already know about like the adoptee citizenship bill that's going on. Like that really brings us back and very directly to what it, what it means to be an immigrant. And I know some an international adoptees see themselves as immigrants or not, but I think for me, that's something I'm personally trying to figure out for myself if I even feel comfortable calling myself an immigrant because I did go through the naturalization process. Like I am officially, I I've been, my paperwork, that is the way I am in this, in this country. And, you know, none of us, if we're not born here, we can't be president. Like there are things that we do not get privileges to be because we are, we are naturalized. We do have that immigrant background and thinking about like, wow, like there are a handful of adoptees who still don't have citizenship. Many of them aren't necessarily like, I think a lot of us are in our twenties and thirties, but like older, like like late thirties, forties, fifties adoptees who've came, who come, who've come now to the USA, who, you know, who've now been deported. And I think really um, deeply for how, especially like, you know, there's, it's like, then you're extending into like adoptees of, you know, not just Asian adoptees. And that's just, it goes into other cultures as well in other countries, but thinking about Asian adoptees and knowing that people can so easily look at us, realize, oh, look, you're, you weren't even born here and you had, you had a name change and you were originally this, that a country like the USA can just throw you out and just be like, no, we don't want to deal with you anymore. And I, I, that's such a scary reality for so many adoptees who don't have citizenship. And I feel like I'm now totally, <laughs> totally going off of my question, but i um, sorry, I was going on a tangent a bit. Anyway, uh, I only have one more question left and I only planned on having this hour. I only planned on having an hour with everyone and it may be even less than an hour, but I appreciate everyone and um, those who have participated. I really um, enjoyed what you had to say and what your feelings were. and. I think the very last thing that I wanted to ask with um, this lecture and this uh, this uh, call is that now, how does knowing this information of global liberalism make you reflect on your immigrant immigrant background as an Asian adoptee, if it does at all? Like, if thinking about how does so many Asians who are now trying to assimilate into the the West Western culture they're kind of some of the issues for why they're trying to f take themselves out of their own family's immigrant story and trying to be more American or more white when maybe we all instead should be, we all should be honing into our, our, our homeland and what it means, our relationship in regards to the USA and other Western countries and how our, how our um, Asian the relationships between the U.S. and our Asian country that we are from. So it's 
yeah, I'll, I'll leave it open so people can begin to respond to that. So kind of a combination of like answering your last question, this question, I think becoming more aware of boba liberalism, especially in terms of being adopted is um, <clears throat> it's it definitely makes me reflect on like how being an adopted into a white family has made it much easier to assimilate, not necessarily that I wanted to, but like that naturally that's what progressed. Um, and so at a time when immigrants are trying to assimilate and they have such a hard time reflecting on like how, despite it not being a choice, it is still a privilege to be able to have that access to whiteness so quickly um, is something to like consider. Um, and also it just makes me reflect on how little I do know, um, especially in terms of how to go beyond boba liberalism. I know, especially when I was a lot younger, all I really knew about Asian issues was the representation problem. Um, and that was the only thing I could really understand or connect with. And when all of your peers are telling you how like Asians aren't they don't have problems and they're not really a minority like the only thing I had to argue was like okay well but look at our representation in the media and look at all these stereotypes and all this stuff um and so to to reflect on that and be like okay wait why didn't I dig deeper what more is there to know um it's really eye-opening I would say like one of the big moments for me is I want to say it was in the last year there was it was probably an Instagram post but essentially it was breaking down like that myth of like Asians making so much more money than other races in the US and breaking that down and saying, okay, but also even looking further, like Chinese versus Indian versus uh, Vietnamese versus et cetera. And it was super interesting just because like I am adopted from China, but my sister is adopted from Vietnam and my brother is adopted from India. And so even looking at that breakdown and seeing like how different um, our experiences could be from one another was super eye-opening and, and realizing that like I obviously I knew that like Asians aren't a monolith but then to see it broken down even further and see like which um which nations of immigrants do have it a lot harder and why um was something that I hadn't necessarily thought to look into until more recently and I, I think this even like really um just reinforces that like there's so much more to learn and to to be a better um i guess just better informed about everything yeah thank you so much Sophie. anyone else have reflections on how having this information now is um how does it impact you as maybe thinking more back to your story of being an international adoptee or that immigrant past that we have personally, have any of you thought more deeply about that? I feel like for me, like, so me and my sister are both adopted just from like different provinces and everything. And there is like an age gap. So she's more like, she's older, but she's like more like not really into like, like anything culturally, like um, doesn't want anything a part of it, which is like totally fine and like, like that's her obviously whereas I'm very more like wanting to get back to my roots sort of and wanting to understand and like be aware and everything so I'm very more like interested like a little bit but um so yeah I sort of it, like I feel like well, well, liberal well, I understand what you're trying to say it's okay <laughs> But um, I think like, it just like sort of, it's not just obviously for like adoptees obviously, but it can go from, you know, like from like Asian to Asian, so. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think about, um, especially like for so, so many years, like I've been into like anti-racism work and like, how do I as an Asian person help other, other people of color, like elevate them? And I really wasn't informed about <laughs> what what kind of oppression does affect Asians, whether it's my experience personally with, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, the surf, not the surface, like we, I think a lot of us still go through like microaggressions and we walk around in school and people make fun of our eyes or people make fun of like certain features that Asians have. But to know that 
for so long, I thought that was the only thing that we were struggling with, that it was only kind of making, picking fun at the way we look and um, the lack of um, media representation. And now, I think the biggest thing I, now with all this information, when I am in anti-racism spaces and when people say, oh, we need to elevate, you know, black Americans and Muslims, and they really just, whether it's intentional or not, I think most spaces do leave out Asians because I think most people do think Asians have, you know, have overcome racism, which <laughs> now, now that we have this information that we really haven't, and that's, that's part of the model minority, that's the kind of, it's, it's not even real, it's completely fake to think that all re Asians are rich and all Asians have, have, it, have it good. And um, I'm just happy to know that I can now, I can now make sure the Asian voice is included in larger, um, larger conversations about race and racism, because I think it's very important. Plus, there's so much so many of us. It's like, if you look at all of the countries in Asia, like oh, <laughs> South Asia, Southeast Asia, like, we take up I think we take up like 60% of the world's population, like Asians themselves, like, they're like, there's so much of the the population of the world's population, even though for us being in the USA, it's of course it's in smaller. We don't see it as much in our day to day life here. But, um, all right. Does anyone else have any last things they want to say? I can totally um, wrap it up a bit earlier tonight because I uh, wasn't sure how um, you know how people were going to feel um, with all the information I was. Um, presenting in the um, presentation. But I'll give you all a couple more seconds to think about if you would like to say anything. I just wanted to quickly reflect on a little bit what you were talking about with the other anti-racism work you've done. And I think a big thing for me and what's been hard is in some of those other spaces, hearing from other people of color how Asians are not affected or like hearing like oppression Olympics type stuff where it's like, there are definitely um, times where obviously like other people are on the platform and it is their turn to talk about what has affected people of their identity. But I definitely like have had the experience many times of being told that like Asian concerns aren't that important and like there is no problem. And I, I think like that attitude is also part of the reason why boba liberalism is prevalent is because even trying to talk about it feels like talking over someone who has quote unquote had it worse. Um, and so I, I think like in a lot of spaces, it's a, a topic that is really lightly touched on because there are other like, more covered in the media, like more obvious forms of oppression against other identities that trying to bring up like anything with the Asian community, especially with like the prevalence of the model minority myth is so difficult to discuss that that's why like it's it's not more widespread what's going on. That's on us. I mean, not just adoptees, but like just the like the Asians who are middle to high class, who are third and fourth generation, who are now like trying to assimilate into white culture. It's on the Asians who are in the West to realize, hey, look at these Asians like who who are struggling a bit more than myself. Like I think all of us need to be become more educated on our own group. And that's and that's on us to kind of let other racial groups know, hey, actually there are big concerns that are happening with us. And if other groups knew that, then be like, oh, of course we'll help. You know, like if, if people just knew, then I feel like we would get a lot more support. It's just, I think we, as the all API people, Asian Pacific Islanders now in the West, we just need to care enough to actually, to, 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 make, to make those issues known in the first place, so. No, I think like, like you do have like um, I think like going back to like the like the anti racism and like all that stuff, like especially with the you know like the hashtag like stop Asian hate. I feel like obviously like you said like March after March it was like all over the place with the media and like um just a lot obviously for us like just to like see it like I had to take a break, but um but like I think like 
even though it's, I think it's almost been almost a year. Um, but like, I think it's definitely like sort of like interesting in the fact of like, it's been going on before obviously COVID. So I mean, like, it's just very interesting to me that it took, you know, however many, um, you know, Atlanta to happen, you know, unfortunately to like have a wake up call, but it has been going on before. Like, even though the hate crimes weren't going on uh, as brutally as they were going on um, during COVID and a little bit before COVID, I definitely think, like, I found it interesting that, like, I guess, like, like a bunch of the bigger, like, um, Asian actors, like Daniel Day Kim and, like, some other people, like, you know, co- going to Congress and doing all that stuff is great. But I think it just sort of, like, sometimes takes away almost because it's like they're not informing it they're just sort of saying okay like um you know like stop Asian hate stop doing this stop you know because which I think like a lot that a lot of that did happen in a um in like March April and then it's sort of like sort of with like I'm not saying um, like sort of like Black Lives Matter like it's sort of like the movement was going on and everything and the movement is still going on but it's sort of like obviously we're we were in a pandemic at the time and like it's sort of like just everybody just got like super like heightened almost you know the media and also everybody else with the facts and everything like that but I think it's definitely like interesting to say like I guess like it's like stagnant almost like the progress where each movement or each um social like awareness has been sort of stagnant almost I don't know if that's just not to say like like people have been doing their research or anything like that or people have been doing like activism but I think it's just sort of like um like nothing has really been like fully like um implicated and like in our society Mm -hmm. no well I hope Asian activism continues on past past the pandemic time, I think we're still in it, but I I hope that it'll continue and Asians will continue to speak up about the different oppressions that we face and not be afraid to um, speak out. Because I think that's part of the model minority is to assume, oh, like the quiet Asian, the Asian who doesn't speak up, the Asian who keeps her mouth shut. That's the role that we were told to play. So I, um, I think it's very important that we are angry Asians and we are loud Asians and we're very, <laughs> We, we make sure people hear us and um, yeah, but thank you all again so much for coming tonight and um, people were popping in and out, but I appreciate any bits of time that you were here tonight. And, and I know it's getting late, especially on the East Coast, it'll be almost at 10 o'clock over there. So thank you all for coming and I appreciated the conversation. And if any of you who know me or can contact the uh, event bright information if you'd like the prezi and any of the links and any more additional readings or the, the the video i showed you you can watch the entire hour which is i would say go ahead go watch the entire lecture but i have all of those documents and articles that if you'd like to continue learning more i can send those over to you all right so um and there's no more last words i will close it out for the night and thank you all so much bye thank you thank you, you.